Morning, everybody. Um, and I'm really glad to be here. We've had a lot of good information this morning, and it's a lot more technical than the things that I want to talk to you about today. I'm going to I'm going to get a little more global, and I'm going to go up to at least 10,000 feet, and sometimes maybe 40,000 feet when we talk about what's coming on the horizon, especially from Washington, D.C., because I think some of those things are going to have a very big impact on the people that, that I work for directly, the Realtors in Wisconsin, but it, I can't imagine that, that bankers and title companies and appraisers aren't going to get caught up in most of the issues that are, that are coming down as well. Um, one of the things I thought I would start with, uh, and, uh, and my presentation are the top five things to watch in 2012, and we'll see just how right I am when it's all done by the time we get to November. A um, little bit first about real estate fundamentals in Wisconsin. I have been to five or six different places in the last five, six weeks, different, uh, mostly boards, local boards, uh, and presented. And most of the time when I go there, I'm talking about what's going on politically because when I'm not lobbying in the Capitol with Tom Larson and we bring in some of our attorneys when we need their technical advice, um, I'm organizing politically and getting the membership involved in, in races all over Wisconsin. And of course, races all over Wisconsin have been nonstop for three years. Usually we have elections every two years, but uh, we have had nonstop elections for the last three. Um, and I, it was he was curious in the introduction. He said, we're always glad to have somebody here from Madison. Most of the time, that scares the hell out of people. Um, but anyways, a little bit about the fundamentals. Um, before I show you and go through some of the specifics, the really good news is that home sales have been up for nine straight months in Wisconsin. Very good news. Home prices have actually gone up a little bit. Uh, inventories are shrinking. And affordability is still very good in Wisconsin with moderate prices and low rates. Uh, <clears throat> talking a little bit about these uh, underpriced sales. I don't know how many of you watched our last uh, email blast on the March home sales in Wisconsin. Up 25% from a year ago. 25%. Those are pretty good numbers. That's, it was across the state, every market, sales were up. As I was mentioning, I, I get out to our local boards and I've been struck by the amount of optimism that I've been hearing all over. It doesn't matter whether it's La Crosse or here or Wausau. I actually have members who are smiling. A year ago they were saying, well, we're really busy and we're working really hard, but they're not closing. Now they're closing. In fact, Dave Stark out of Stark Company in Madison, he does a quarterly newsletter and it came through my email uh, last night, so I was looking at it before today, and Dave's very analytical. To know Dave Stark, he's kind of an intellectual type company owner, and he really digs into the numbers, and he had predicted all along that the first quarter would be good, but he said, I didn't know it would be this good. His sales were up 21%, and his offers were up 40% in the first quarter, so he's ecstatic as a company owner. The other thing I think that is noteworthy on prices is for the first time in March, for I think over two years, prices stabilized. In fact, they actually went up, I think, about two-tenths of a percent. And you can't start going north until you find that floor. I don't know. I'm not suggesting that we found the floor. But it's good that for the first time in a couple years, prices have actually stabilized. Inventory and selection. In July of 2011, we had 72,000 listings statewide. You go forward to March 2012 and it's a little over 52,000. Inventory is coming down and that's, a, that's extremely important, uh, important for price. Uh, price is stabilizing and starting to move back up. Inventory, everybody in this room that, that's in real estate knows that uh, for the last few years we've had a lot of inventory and the shadow inventory coming onto the market and that has definitely affected the price of housing. So. The inventory going down is a good thing. Financing, 3%, 4% rates, it depends on what you want to get these days. I'll give you a little story on how I, the financing is, is really quite good and you know that. My wife and I closed on a condo in October of 2008. Yeah, exactly, 2008. 
Um, a year later, we were going to look to refinance. And of course, we brought in the appraiser, and he took a look at it, and we discovered what we really already knew was probably the case. We were underwater, and I couldn't do it. So I was in my, in my uh, credit union a couple weeks ago, and the woman I'm talking to says, have you looked at refinancing? And I said, and I think you know the big push for refis is on and has been. I said, no, I haven't this time because I didn't really want to pay the appraiser again to find out that I may be underwater and they won't do it again. So she said, you should, you should apply it because you might be eligible. I am eligible and I just will close in June on a 15 year 3% rate. 15 years, 3%. I don't think we've had rates that low since the 1950s when Father Knows Best was the hottest you know, sitcom on television. So those are extraordinarily good rates. Obviously, that's helping drive the market that's been improving. We're still very affordable. In February, the index was at 280%. It's down to 260%. Price stabilization, those kinds of factors are starting to take hold. And finally, unemployment. You're all watching the political campaigns in the recall election, and you know I was in the hotel room this morning getting ready, and one of the things I always do is leave the TV on the local channels just to see what kind of political activity and the temperature is where you go. I know. I am one of those kinds of people. Um, and, and it's pretty hot up here, and Eau Claire TV is really, is really the battleground. And assuming the polls are correct and Tom Barrett comes out of the the primary today, the whole fight, nobody's talking about collective bargaining where it all started and what it's really about. They're talking about unemployment. Walker is saying when I was elected, unemployment was 7.6% and today it's 68 And he's right. And, he, and they're arguing on what's going on in the figures. For the first, almost the whole first year he was in office, we actually lost jobs. But in the first quarter of this year, we gain jobs and the unemployment rate is coming down. Tom Barrett is running ads that says, you promised 250,000 jobs and we're number 40 in the country in job creation. So you're just gonna have to decide for yourselves whose figures you believe and you will have about 27 days to decide who you believe before we get there. But the fact is, when he took office it was 7.6 and today it's 6.8 in Wisconsin. Another good trend overall. Of course, the dark clouds, I think you're all aware of it, the foreclosures, those have slowed down a bit, but uh, Wisconsin is better than most states. The worst states, of course, were Nevada, Arizona, Florida, Michigan, and California. Uh, at the peak of the foreclosure waves when they were coming onto the market, those five states accounted for slightly over 50% of all foreclosures in the country, five states. So a disproportionate share of the problem was coming out of, out of the problem children. Wisconsin didn't have as many of them, so we haven't had the severity that has come along with that, but it has obviously impacted our market. Financing, uh, the price of money is quite good, but sometimes getting the, the deal done and getting the financing come, that coming together is very difficult. I, as I said earlier, I was in Wausau a couple of weeks ago for a fundraising auction for the local board up in central Wisconsin. And I knew I was coming to do this, this seminar today and I said, what's the most difficult part of the process day in and day out? And I asked five separate people and I didn't do it all at the same table. I moved around and asked the question. And four out of the five said, lack of communication before we get to closing. Surprises as we're getting into closing. And they all said it's communication. Some of them said maybe some of it has to do with us. Some of it has to do with the, the banks that they're dealing with. But they all said it's the frustrating part. We talked a little bit about this today with Seth and all the things that go in, into underwriting standards and getting the loan. I think things are getting better. But it tends to be, from our perspective, the slowest part of the transaction. And we actually already did talk about short sales. I was a little late on that. Um, boy, I almost hesitated. There's been a lot of talk about that here today already. NAR is doing what they can, our National Association of Realtors. They understand, they've, they've heard about it from 
every state in the country. I don't know if what they've got in mind is going to work. One of the things they're talking about is actually requiring the uh, mortgage, the, the people who deal with mortgages to give you a first response when you, when you want to do the short in 30 days and then requiring a final answer in 60 days. I was talking a little bit about that earlier. And it sounds good, but for the life of me, I can't quite figure out how they're going to enforce that. It's, it's another one of those ideas that, that has some merit, but we'll see how it plays out. They're talking about rolling some of those, eyes, those ideas out in June. And we're on our way to DC in May, so we'll be bringing some more information back on that for you when we get back from uh, DC in the May meetings. Macroeconomics. And I won't spend too much time on this, but we all know, you already, we talked about it, interest rates are about as good as you can possibly imagine them getting. I remember when they were five and six percent, I didn't really think they would get much better. Now you can get them at three and four percent. We still have some lending issues that are going on. We have Fannie and Fred and underwriting standards and, and those tend to change. The banks feel the pressure on some of those issues and consumer confidence when this was put together it's still not great but it's getting better and I wanted to share I wanted to share one statistic for you there's a there's many different ways to gauge consumer confidence and for those of you who list and sell homes on a daily basis you're feeling the, the confidence because sales are starting to move Gallup has one measure of consumer confidence and it's how much on average on a daily basis are people spending? In January of 2009, it was $60 per day. Uh, today, it's $70 a day on average. So consumer confidence is moving up and I think you're seeing that with the market and the way things are trending. It didn't say. The, the question was before 2007, 2008, when things really started to tank, what would the per day spending have been according to Gallup? I didn't see that. This is really important, especially, especially for realtors in the room these issues are, are going to be very hot, very important, and you're going to hear a lot about these from both NAR and WRA working together. If you're watching what's going on with the federal government, deficits, taxes, Obama going in one direction, the House particularly going in another direction, they're hungry for money, they want to do something about the deficits, and all of these issues are on the table, the GSEs. You know, three years ago, they basically were taken over by the federal government. And since that time, the feds have pumped about, I think the number is $165 billion into the GSEs to keep them solvent. And there's a fair number of people who think that that is a lowball number, that it's actually, there's more to come, and that they're, because of the load that they've taken, that it's going to require more taxpayer assistance. The problem with GSE reform isn't that it's going to happen. I think most people know that there are some in Congress that think GSEs play a, a, a very important role as it is today and should be left alone and the problem will somehow magically correct itself. And there are others that would like to phase GSEs out altogether. And that second option, if it's done too fast, could be a real problem for the real estate industry. If you, don't, if, you, if you take the secondary mortgage market and just take GSEs out of it today, I don't think there's enough private out there to come back and fill it in to do what the GSEs are doing right now. So the fight in Congress, there's a fair number of people on the Republican side, Ron Johnson's one of them, who looks at the GSEs and says, we should probably get rid of these things Maybe not right away, but over time. There's the other side of the divide that says they, they uh, play way too of important of a role. 
and we got to keep them around and we shouldn't do it too fast because it could really disrupt a fragile recovery. That's going to be a very big issue and I believe that we'll be looking and dealing with that just like MID, which I'll touch on in a second, after November 6th of this year. I don't think anything will happen on, the, on much of anything until after November 6th. Mortgage interest deduction. You know, the realtors in this room know that it's something that, that we've, we've been paying a lot of attention to for a long time, but I've never seen the kind of activity in Congress as we have now. Uh, President Obama has been in office, this is his fourth year, four of his budgets, every single one of them would have reduced the mortgage interest deduction at certain levels down the top, the cap at 35, down to 28. Every single budget. Congress has not gone along with it. The Democrats, when they had control, didn't do it. Now we have divided government with the House and Senate, and they haven't done it either. But they're still talking about it and there are, is a serious discussion going back to all the deficit talk of what you do with MID. And it's for one simple reason, they need money. And the fall election in November is on one side, you have the president saying we should do one set of things this way, and then you have the Republicans on the other side saying we should do it this way, and then you have these commissions that do things like say, phase out mortgage interest deduction and turn it into a credit. So it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big deal. Let me see. The average mortgage interest deduction in the state of, in, in the country rather, is something over $12,000 a year. The average. So that's a lot of money. Qualified residential mortgage, 20% down. Can you imagine what might happen to a fragile real estate recovery if every sale required 20% down? There's some people who think that that's a pretty good idea. It used to be that way a long time ago, before the era of 5% or 3% or the different programs that, that we've had over the last 20, 25 years. But with the GSEs in the shape they're in, 165 billion that they've pumped in already and the need and looking for more money to deal with deficits, they look at things like that in the qualified residential mortgage to shore up GSEs, the requirements, lending, the whole thing. I, don't, I haven't spoke to too many realtors who think that 20% down for everybody is a real good idea, especially in this economy. But we will be dealing with that as well. It all comes down to a couple of things that you have here on the chart. There's a lot of people, there's, there's quite a few people who believe that renting, that a lot of people who are in homes never should have been in homes, that there were people getting loans for too much money, which was part of the problem that we've been living through the last four years, versus those who believe that home ownership is just a really good policy and the more we can make that available to people in a credible way, we're gonna be better off. On the other side of it, you have a lot of people on the GOP side that say tax reform is not only really important, but necessary to get the economy moving. So all of these issues on top, most of them are federal government driven. Right after November 6th, they're even talking about lame, pay attention to this one. After November 6th, before the new Congress is sworn in in January of next year, they're talking about lame duck sessions. Lame duck sessions are usually you should really be afraid of lame duck sessions because it's typically a lot of people are on their way out. They no longer have political considerations they need to worry about. That's why they often have lame duck sessions is because they can do things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. They're talking about some of these issues in a lame duck session. We'll be watching that and we'll be letting you know, particularly for the people that I work, work with, um, some of these issues could be on the table as soon as then. Real quickly, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail on all these issues. It matters who gets elected. It matters a lot. We've talked about it over and over. November 2010 happened and we went from single party control with the Democrats in Madison to single party control with Republicans in control of Madison. We went from Jim, Jim Doyle to Scott Walker, 
and both houses of the legislature came along with Scott Walker that night. There's been a lot of turmoil, there's been a, and we're all going to live through it, especially in the next 27 days up to June 5th. But even un, with all of that turmoil, I've worked for WRA for 25 years, and in the last year and a half, it was January of, of 2011 to March of this year, we had the single most productive legislative session we've ever had as an industry, hands down. We've got things done that, that we finished finally on this list that we've been working on for years. If you've, if you've had a chance to hear Tom Larson talk, who is our expert on so many of these land use issues especially, we never could get those things done. We kept bringing them back to our members year after year after year, help us try to get this done. We got the right political environment, and the list is, 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 is amazing. It's, they said, why don't you get your list ready for, for next year? And we said, yeah, we'll get to that, but we got a lot of stuff cleaned up in the meantime. The property tax freeze, it's estimated by the state budget office that it will save the average homeowner $350 per year. The real estate examining board might seem like a real sleeper, but the old real estate board was very unresponsive. We changed it back to an examining board to make it more efficient and responsive when we want to change forms, particularly. Housing impact statements, health savings accounts. We were, we were one of, we were either the only one or one of two states that did not allow for the state deduction for HSAs in the whole country. We passed it three times when Jim Doyle was governor and he vetoed it every single time. We finally got that through. It was the second bill that Scott Walker signed into law. Landlord-tenant, we, we passed two major bills on landlord-tenant dealing with some very significant issues for the first time in over 15 years. DNR permitting process, Chapter 30, development moratoria, wetland re regulations. We eliminated the farmland conversion fee. These are all things that we had to have the, the stars line up and the planets all line up and we were able to get those done. We had an extraordinarily successful session and that's one of the reasons that we'll be as involved as we are in the recall fight. Issue five, one of my favorites. Um, probably not yours though. Never ending elections. We have two election cycles this year. We have the one that's leading up to, to June 5th and that is the gubernatorial recall, lieutenant governor recall, and the four state senators that are, are going on the same day. It probably seems like a waste of money and a lot of white noise to everybody. It sure was a lot of noise in the, in the hotel room this morning uh, for the Terry Moulton, Kristen Dexter race. But significant things can come of that, very significant things. And as an association, as the person who heads up our political operation, I, get, I can get in a lot of trouble depending on what I say and where I say it and to who I say it. But for, for the people in this room that don't know that, our association endorsed Scott Walker in 2010 and we've endorsed him again in the recall election. I just showed you that list. There were reasons that we, re, we want him reelected and we will do what we can. And it's going to be a close race. There's no guarantees. I think it's a 50-50 proposition at best. Some people think that he's, he's going to get in with a bigger margin than most people expect. One of the things I do is look at polling, a lot of polling, and since last October all the way through today, no matter where it was, no matter whose poll it was, Scott Walker is somewhere between 47% and 51%. It depends on the day and the mood. I think it's going to be another Prosser and Kloppenberg race. Could be a recount that close and we will set records for turnout. You have the four state Senate seats. The Senate's controlled 17-16 with Republicans. They lost two seats a year ago in those recalls. Sheila Harsdorf held on, but two others didn't. There's four seats up, they need one to flip, and it goes to the Democrats. However, they passed a reapportionment plan that most people pay no attention to. I think, and you can watch and see if this turns out to be true, or you can make fun of me if I ever come back and I'm wrong. Um, if the Democrats get only get one seat and it flips 17-16 Democrat, I believe the Republicans will take it back November 6th because of those new maps. If the Democrats get two seats 
It's going to be tougher. It could still flip in November. Most people don't pay attention to reapportionment, but the whole state every 10 years has to be redrawn all those lines. The Fitzgerald brothers were the ones who drafted and helped pass the lines that will be in effect for 10 years. And they're, they're, they're slightly skewed towards what the Fitzgeralds would like much more than the other side. Um, and I'm actually, I'm being kind, they're actually quite skewed. But that's what, that's what majority parties do. And then as we go to November 6, we've got a presidential election. And we are, and, and this is the kind of stuff that I do, I'm, I'm not an attorney. I, I went to Madison and studied history and political science. So this is the kind of stuff that I really like. And it probably bores you to tears, which is why I like color graphs, because it makes the point. The closest top of the ticket race we've had in a presidential election was 2004. 2.9 million voters, the highest turnout we ever had, and it was separated by 11,300 votes, 300 votes. It was under a half a percentage point difference between Kerry and Bush. I think that's for the moment where we're headed with the recall. I think this is, the, this is the model map that you're going to likely play out between Tom Barrett and Scott Walker. It's almost right down the middle. And Wisconsin, historically, you can see the numbers there. We've been a battleground seven out of the last eight times. And six of those last eight, the Democrats have won, sometimes by the narrowest of margins. But, and this is one of the reasons you're seeing the unions take on Walker in a very nationalized election that the whole world is watching. It, it really is as historic as you hear. It's only the third time in our history that a governor has gone to recall. Swing states can either look like this or they can look like that. 2008, look what Barack Obama did in Wisconsin. Four years earlier, we were right down the middle. Four years later, he turned that blue, that map so blue Lyndon Johnson would be clapping and rolling over in his grave ecstatic with joy because Johnson was the only other one to ever make it look like that before. And that went back to 1964. Two years later, look what Scott Walker did. He turned it mostly red. Two years swings. That's what swing states do. That's, just so you understand it, the unions are not only mad at Scott Walker, they're looking at Wisconsin and they're going, this is the state where AFSCME was born in Madison in 1936. We're a swing state. We can go down the middle or we can swing one way or the other if we're really mad. If the, if the Democrats have their way, they want June 5th to look like 2008. And the Republicans and Scott Walker want it to look a lot more than like 2010. We'll all know in 27 days which way it's going to look. That's one of the reasons Wisconsin was put in the position it is, is because we are that close. Takeaways. Issues are really important, and I know there's a lot of anger whether you don't like Scott Walker or whether you like Scott Walker, you, th you agree with what he did or don't agree with what he did. Issues are important. I showed you the list for the real estate industry and what we accomplished. Set aside all the acrimony, we had the most productive session we've had in my 25 years with WRA. These issues will matter. They will matter to you, your taxes, your property. They'll matter to your community. They'll matter to you. And what happens on June 6th, well, June 5th and November 6th, is going to play out across the board in DC Madison and local governments. So my recommendation for everybody, whether you like politics or not, and there's mostly people saying that they're a little unhappy with Wisconsin politics these days, stay engaged, don't get mad and hide, stay in the fight, make sure you mark your calendars and vote, and, be, and trust me, we'll be reminding you, those of you who I work for. But uh, if you can contribute, contribute, if you can get involved in a campaign of your choice, you should do that. And I would be remiss if I didn't say, watch for what we 
send you from, from WRA because we're going to be making the case on one candidate versus, versus the other, whether it's Tom Barrett or, or Kathleen Falk. I had, the, I had the brochure sent to the printer today, and I had two of them. They're sitting there parked and waiting. One is Scott Walker with Barrett, and the other one is Scott Walker with Kathleen Falk. I think Tom Barrett's going to come through the primary perhaps even easily if the polls are correct, and they usually are. But you never know. This is the day and age of surprises. We live in a swing state, and sometimes it's really blue, and sometimes it's really red. But we'll find out. And that's, those are my remarks. <laughs>